Greetings, this is Greg. The 1960s was a great time to be a car enthusiast in the United States. During this decade, each model year brought in new and exciting developments, and 1968 was certainly no exception. The muscle cars from General Motors, meaning the Chevrolet Chevelle SS396, Pontiac GTO, Oldsmobile 442, and Buick GS400, got new body styles along with great performance options. Chrysler Corporation, with the Dodge and Plymouth brands, really stepped it up in a big way for 68. This is going to be a long video because there were just so many muscle cars in 68 and I have a lot to say about each one. I want to start off talking about what was happening over at Ford. During the previous two model years, Ford's muscle car in the intermediate segment had been the Fairlane GT and the automatic transmission variant, the Fairlane GTA. These didn't quite have the performance to match the competition and generally did not sell too well. For 1968, Ford updated these cars with very aggressive styling. In the 1960s, styling had a big effect on a car's sales. Ford experienced this firsthand with the Mustang back in 64. When the Mustang came out, it sold like crazy. Yet in mechanical terms, it was just a Ford Falcon sedan with a more sporty looking body. The Falcon even had a solid race history, giving it performance credentials, and in a practical sense was a better car than the Mustang. It didn't matter. People wanted the Mustang due to its styling. This lesson was not lost on Ford. So for 1968, they were not too concerned about updating the Fairlane's mechanicals. In that respect, it was much the same as the previous year's model. Instead, they worked on the styling. The new Fairlane looked great. Not only that, it was offered in a number of different body styles. For muscle car enthusiasts, the two-door hardtop or fastback would be the more common choices. You could get Ford's popular muscle car engine, which was a 390 cubic inch four barrel carbed V8 in any of these body styles. But as this is a muscle car video, I'll focus on the two-door cars. It's worth noting that the four-door car is actually the lightest model, and these cars are very light, especially by modern standards. Weight was kept down by Ford's unit body construction, which was different from the body on frame method used at Chevrolet and other GM divisions of the time. I do prefer the body on frame type, but there is no question that Ford was ahead of the curve here, as nearly every car made today is unit body. It's important to keep in mind that the weights shown here are for the base models. For example, by the time you add in the big block 390, a heavy duty automatic transmission, plus a drive shaft and rear end that can take all the power and abuse, the weight goes up quite a bit. Figure 3,600 to 3,700 pounds for a well-optioned car so equipped. While the Ford does generally have a weight advantage over the GM cars, it's not by much. There wasn't exactly a muscle car branded version of the Fairlane. For example, if you wanted a muscle car from Chevrolet, there was no question which Chevrolet you should buy. It was the SS396. With Plymouth, it was the GTX. The branding of these cars made it clear they were the muscle car variants and had the standard features to make sure that they had performance to back that up. At Ford, it was different. There was no specific muscle car variant of the Fairlane. A buyer of this car wanting a muscle car in 1968 had to choose the options accordingly. In other words, it could be a full-fledged muscle car via options, but there was no specific option package or separate model designation to make it into a traditional intermediate type muscle car. There was the Torino package and the GT package, and they could be combined to make a Torino GT, but that by itself was not a real muscle car. The standard engine in the Torino GT was a 302 V8 with low compression and a two barrel carb, only 210 gross horsepower. It should be noted that in certain months due to an auto worker strike, the slightly less powerful 289 was the standard engine. To order a Fairlane as a muscle car, most buyers opted for the 390 cubic inch V8 with 325 horsepower. There was also a 265 horsepower version of the same engine. This was slightly less expensive and didn't require premium fuel. Other than for a tow vehicle, there wasn't much point to that version of the 390, at least in my view. I suppose if I wanted a Ford muscle car in 1968, I would have ordered a Fairlane Fastback with the GT package. In my view, that certainly gives it the muscle car look. The Torino package adds in some luxury 
and um, it does add a small amount of weight. The Torino package adds about 32 pounds. I just think it's worth it. The Fastback, aka sports roof option, only added 14 pounds and may have improved aerodynamics. At least that was the idea. At this point, with a Torino GT Fastback, you have a car that looks like a muscle car. Then option in the 325 horse 390 and either a four speed or a three speed automatic. Both of these four transmissions were quite good. I would also add in power disc brakes, which was a required option on a GT with the 390. And I would add in the wide oval tires. At this point, it's a solid muscle car. Keep in mind, there were a lot of other ways to go about this. You could get the same performance options on a non-GT hardtop or a coupe Fairlane, giving you the same performance at a lower price, along with a more sleeper-like appearance, if that's your thing. You could get that high compression four barrel 390 in a four door or a station wagon. In terms of performance, the 390 Fairlane lagged behind the competition. And I'm sorry, Ford enthusiasts, but it's true. That 325 horsepower rating was pretty optimistic. The truth is the high compression 394 barrel was probably overrated by about 40 horsepower, even considering that we're talking about SAE gross horsepower. The 390 was a great engine. It still is. It sounds good. It's super reliable. But in stock form, it's just not that powerful, and it doesn't respond very well to the typical weekend modifications, at least not as well as some of the other cars in this video. Performance of the 390 Fairlane was still competitive, though, just not near the top of the heap. The 325 horse Fairlane was a good muscle car, comfortable, still fast by standards of the day. In a straight line, it would easily outrun the typical small block pony cars like Mustangs and Camaros, and it would smoke most imported sports cars, just not most other muscle cars. The sales literature of the day listed an optional high compression 427 cubic inch V8 with 390 horsepower. However, it appears that this engine was never put into one of these cars, and if it was, it was in some very limited number for a race team or something like that. It was not an engine a typical buyer could get in this car. Now, around April of 1968, so late to the party for this model year, a 428 cubic inch engine became available with 335 horsepower. This brought the car's performance up quite a bit and knocked about one full second off the car's quarter mile time. With the 428, it would be able to beat some of the competing cars from GM or Chrysler. However, it's important to keep in mind that 428 powered Fairlane was rare. These engines were rare as hen's teeth in these cars in 1968. I want to stress that a normal Fairlane muscle car that year was powered by the 390. The rest of the car was pretty typical 1960s Ford, which I suppose is good and bad. In fact, it's much the same as the previous Fairlane the, of the previous two model years. In addition to the exterior styling changes, the interior now had a much more modern look, and it was safer too. Shoulder harnesses, padded dash, stuff, stuff that was typical for this model year. I remember when I first sat in one of these cars, I was disappointed because I thought those four gauge pods would house gauges. Some do. One houses a fuel and temperature gauge, another a speedometer, but often one was blank and another was just a collection of warning lights. Optionally, you could add in a tachometer and also a clock. The clock would be in a shared pod with various warning lights. The rest of the car is just okay in my view. The front suspension is typical 1960s Ford with that spring on top configuration. This works well enough, but it's no better than what's on a muscle car from GM or Chrysler. And what I don't like about the Ford setup is that that spring tower takes up a lot of room in the engine compartment. When you put a big block Ford engine in there, it's very cramped and hard to work on. And God help you if you want to add headers to your big block Ford, which is something that was an easy afternoon modification on most of the General Motors muscle cars. The rear suspension is nothing special on the Ford. It's a solid rear axle like all the other 1968 muscle cars, and the Ford uses leaf springs. Now, all the Chrysler products, their muscle cars anyhow, used rear leaf springs as well, but they had a better layout for them. The Ford rear suspension isn't bad, but it's just not quite as good as what was on the Dodges and Plymouths, and certainly not as good as what was on the General Motors cars. So the 390 can't quite keep up. The suspension is no better than the competitions. In fact, it's worse. So what's good about this car? Well, a few things. 
Again, it's a solid, reliable car, and if the styling grabs you, it might be the car for you. It was the only intermediate muscle car in 1968 with a true fastback. I also think it looks cool. Additionally, the car was inexpensive. A Torino GT Fastback was only $2,742. Of course, that's with the weak two-barrel 302, but it gives the look of the muscle car. And based on the sales numbers, it appears that was important. Ford sold a lot of these cars, and I think a big part of that was the look and the low price. $158, an additional $158, I should say, got you the high-performance 390, put into your Torino GT. Another $184 brought in the four-speed manual with your choice of close or wide ratio gears. That's under $3,100, and that's for a Torino, which is the luxury model plus the GT package, not a base-stripped Fairlane. Ford's pricing here was very competitive. Quarter mile times for this card varied a lot in magazine testing of the day. There was, there was some downright cheating by manufacturers. Hopefully you've seen my 1966 episode where I talk about that and provide proof of it. Even when magazines were testing legit showroom stock cars, there is no question that advertising dollars had an effect on these magazine articles. In what I think was a very honest article, Car Life magazine ran one of these cars, a 394 barrel automatic car, with a 3.25 to 1 axle ratio. In other words, a typical setup a buyer would choose. I'm not sure what options the car had beyond that, but based on the test price and weight, it appears to have been a fairly loaded down luxury barge, but less power steering, which is odd. The car also had its emission controls hooked up. That wasn't always the case when they tested these cars. You see, 1968 was really the first year in which we saw serious efforts at controlling tailpipe emissions. Now, there were some minor efforts starting around 64 or so, and things ramped up quite a bit in the 70s, but 68 is really the year where you can point at and say, okay, you know, this is, they did this. So, however, these early emission strategies did almost nothing for the tailpipe emissions, but hurt the running of the cars. They hurt power, increased fuel economy, and in the case of the Fairlane with the 390, the high compression 390, they turned the idle speed up so much it made the car difficult to stop with an automatic transmission. Anyway, with all these problems, all this going on, it ran the quarter mile in 15.8 seconds at 90 miles per hour. I have no doubt that's a real time, but it's on the slower side of the scale, probably because of the options and probably the fact that it really was right off the showroom floor and it may have been in less than ideal conditions as well. Now, automotive magazines would often photograph one car and test another. Carcraft magazine took that to an extreme and road tested one car and track tested another in their 1968 test of this car. The car they drove around was a 394 barrel automatic. The rear end gearing was unspecified, but they got 18 miles per gallon in combined highway, city, and mountain driving, so it clearly was not geared for the quarter mile. However, they tested a different 390 car at the drag strip and never specified what transmission or gearing it had. That car ran high 14s at almost 100 miles per hour. I suspect it was a four-speed car with very aggressive rear end gears. Then they ran a 428 powered car. Again, unspecified transmission and rear end gears. It ran 14.2 at 105 miles per hour. Considering this was in Carcraft magazine, I'm assuming aggressive gearing. I should add that I have this Carcraft article on my Patreon page in the paid section. Actually, I have all the articles used in this video there and all the brochures. They are all in high resolution PDF format. Next up, I want to talk about the Fairlane's stablemate from Mercury. Mercury was Ford's upmarket division. They basically sold nicer versions of the same cars and at a slightly higher price. Mercury's version of the Fairlane was called the Comet. The upscale version was the Cyclone. Think of the Cyclone as Mercury's version of Ford's Torino. Same thing. It's a trim package with luxury appointments. Then there was the Cyclone GT, so that's much like the Torino GT, but more upmarket, nicer, more exclusive. Like the Torino GT, the Cyclone GT's standard engine was the low-compression two-barrel carb 302. However, in the Mercury from earlier on, you could option in a high-compression four-barrel 302, 
And that option was very low cost, and that gave it 230 horsepower. That wasn't a lot. A 302 Cyclone GT was no muscle car, even with the high compression uh, four-barrel option. But it did have the look and enough performance so that it was still fun. And if you were sitting next to, say, you know, a Triumph TR6 or something like that at a stoplight, you were going to win. But to turn it into a legitimate muscle car, as with the Fairlanes, you had to option in the high compression four barrel 390. Also, the 428 became an option, but as with the Fairlane, extremely rare. Performance was essentially identical to the Fairlane. With the 390, this is normally a low to mid 15s car. With the 428, it's a mid 14s car. Car Life magazine ran a 14.4 at 99 miles per hour with an automatic and 3.91 gears. That's really quick, but keep in mind those gears have a really big effect here. And as a general rule, anything numerically larger than about 3.5 to 1 gets into the non-streetable category. Those 3.91 gears make the car even more of a gas guzzler and almost unusable on a long trip. That's really important to understand when trying to have some sort of apples to apples comparisons. The Cyclone GT was a rare car. They didn't sell a lot of these, but they're an important part of muscle car history. And I do like them, but there's no denying they were not a popular choice for buyers. So let's move on to a car that was a popular choice, a car that was a sales leader all through the muscle car era and with good reason, the Chevrolet Chevelle SS396. The car had new styling for 68. It looked totally different this year, as did all the muscle cars in this model year. Mechanically, it was much the same as the previous year, which is okay. It's not identical. There were refinements, but it's very similar to the previous year's model in mechanical terms. It's riding on GM's A-body chassis, which has a perimeter frame with the body mounted on top. It's an excellent chassis. It's strong, makes everything easy to work on. It uses coil spring suspension all the way around. It's the best suspension of all the 60s muscle cars and the best chassis, with the exception of its GM stablemates, which have the same basic setup, but some of which are biased more towards handling, some more towards ride. The base engine in the SS396 had 325 horsepower with a 350 horsepower engine optional. There was also a version with 375 advertised horsepower, but these were rarely mentioned, if at all, in the sales literature and few were built. The standard at no extra cost transmission was a three-speed manual, which was not common. Most people either got a four-speed manual or one of the two automatic transmissions. Chevrolet's two-speed power glide was one automatic transmission, but this was a total performance killer. You really didn't want that. If you wanted an automatic in your SS396, you probably wanted the Turbo Hydromatic. This was GM's excellent Turbo 400 three-speed. There was no better automatic transmission in the 1960s. I don't really have anything negative to say about this car. That big block 396 was probably the best of the commonly available muscle car engines. It had a lot of power, but it also had a lot of potential power, more than the other GM engines in the same size range. The car suspension, transmission, the overall quality of the body, the electrical system, everything was first rate in the Chevelle SS396. It was also inexpensive. The base price of an SS396 was $2,899. That was with a bench seat and a three-speed manual transmission, but the SS396 was absolutely the best of the low-cost muscle cars in 68, and a strong case can be made that it was the best muscle car of 68. I should also add that it was possible in 1968 to order a really fast Chevelle with a small block engine. They offered an ultra high compression 327 cubic inch V8 with 325 horsepower in this car. Thus, you could order a base model, get that engine with a four speed. It could not be had with an automatic, not that engine. Um, but with that combination, the, the 325 horse 327 four speed, you would have a low cost car that would run with an SS396 and most of the other muscle cars. Also in 1968, emission regulations, as I said earlier, were starting to tighten up, and nobody really knew how to control emissions yet. Thus, all the Chevelles with manual transmissions only, not automatics, but manual transmissions that year had this stupid air injection reactor pump on them. This was an engine-driven pump that forced air into the exhaust system. The idea was that the air would allow unburned fuel in the exhaust to burn up on its way out of the tailpipe. 
these didn't really work. And when they did, they would cause backfires. The pumps cost fuel to spin, thus increase the car's fuel consumption, which is not good for emissions. What they really did is skew the emissions test results. They were testing pollutants back then by particles of pollutants per million particles. So you put a lot of air into your exhaust and your pollutant particles per million go down. These pumps stayed in production for about 10 years before they gave up on this stupid idea. Strangely, there were not a lot of magazine tests on the 396 Chevelle in 1968. However, there was another car we can use as a stand-in. It was a two-seater Chevrolet in 1968 featuring the 396 engine, optionally anyhow. This car features the same engine specs, transmission, and rear-end gear ratios as the Chevelle, and it's pretty close in weight. Can you guess what car I'm talking about? Well, it's the El Camino. Okay, I misled you calling it a two-seater, but it could be ordered that way. Magazines were testing the El Camino SS396 and getting quarter mile times from about 14.5 to about 14.8 from 95 to 99 miles per hour. That's with an automatic and 3.31 gears. The Chevelle is a bit lighter than the El Camino and with better traction. A 350 horse Chevelle SS396, as it was commonly optioned with an automatic and 331 gearing, was a very honest mid-14s car. As with the previous year, there was a 375 horse 396, which could be optioned in, called the L78. This was basically a race engine. It featured 11 to 1 compression, a very hot solid lifter cam, a big Holly carb on an aluminum intake manifold, and more. It was intentionally underrated. Its true gross horsepower was closer to 425. This engine wasn't normally mentioned in the sales literature, and most people didn't know about it. But if you did, and that's what you wanted, you could order it. The vast majority of SS396 buyers opted for the 325 and 350 horse versions. These were low maintenance, got decent fuel economy, and although they required premium fuel, they were not too picky about it. They also pulled hard from low RPM, requiring minimal driver skill to get the most out of them. The L78 with its 375 advertised horsepower was really more of a race engine would not be a good choice for a car to drive to work in every day or to take a road trip in. You could option up a Chevelle to be as nice as the more expensive muscle cars, and the potential performance of this car was huge. You could make a base SS396 with 325 horsepower, a legitimate 450 horse car in a weekend with a cam, headers, and car jetting. A lot of people did just that, and today the Chevelle SS396 is a very desirable. Next up, we have another low-priced car, the Plymouth Roadrunner. This was built on the Chrysler B-body chassis, but with all-new sheet metal for 68. Most people consider the updated styling for this model year a big hit as compared with the 66 to 67 Plymouth B-bodies. The 68 Roadrunner was brilliant. It was the right car at the right time, aimed at the right people, and importantly, at the right price. The base price was $2,870, which included everything needed to make it a legitimate performance car. The powerful Roadrunner 383 engine and a four-speed with a floor-mounted shifter were standard, and the car had an upgraded suspension, so it wasn't only fast in a straight line. By 1960 standards, the brakes were pretty good, too. The idea here was for Plymouth to have a low-priced car with the performance of a fully-fledged muscle car. In other words, the performance of a base Chevelle SS 396 or Fairlane 390, but at a lower price. Not only that, the Roadrunner was a larger car with more room, and that mattered during the muscle car era because not everybody was drag racing these things. For most buyers, these cars had to do double duty as family cars, grocery getters, or often just daily transportation to and from work. The 68 Roadrunners were offered as a basic no-frills performance car. The interior looked like it came right out of a taxi cab. A bench seat, no carpeting, just rubber mats. The rear windows didn't roll down, they just popped out via a latch and hinge mechanism. Initially, these were offered only as coupes, no hard tops, no convertibles. Of course, it had to be a coupe in order to use that lower cost pop-out rear window. It's, it, when I say pop-out, it pops out at the back and it's hinged up front, so it creates a little bit of airflow. Now, if an automatic transmission was optioned in, it had to be a column shift transmission because the bench seat didn't allow for the use of Plymouth Center Console and associated shifter. All the 68 Roadrunners, at least maybe until very late in the model year, 
had bench seats. Mechanically, it featured a high compression 383 four barrel with 335 horsepower. This was claimed to be an engine unique to the Roadrunner within Plymouth's lineup. The normal or non-Roadrunner four barrel 383 had 330 horsepower, not 335 like the Roadrunner. I'm fairly certain the long blocks on the 330 and the 335 horsepower versions of these engines are identical. Of course, a 383-powered B-body Plymouth was nothing new. It had been possible to order a similar mid-size Plymouth with similar performance and everything since 1965. What was new here was the packaging. The Roadrunner package put all the performance stuff into a base car and added the Roadrunner character and a cute sounding horn along with some bulges on the hood to give it that muscle car look. The 68 Roadrunner had the right combination of muscle car appearance with legitimate performance to back it up and at a low price and in a very practical package for an everyday use car. Optionally, a buyer could get the much more powerful 426 Hemi engine, which was the only engine option in this car for 1968. Very few people did that as it was an almost $800 option on a sub $2,800 car. Because the Roadrunner was so spartan, it was also a lightweight car by Chrysler B-body standards, meaning that this was the lightest production streetcar which could be factory equipped with a 426 Hemi during this model year. With the optional Dana 410 rear end gears, these things were amazing drag racers. However, a typical 68 Roadrunner was a 383 car with an automatic and 3.23 to one rear end gears. I think the 68 Roadrunner had the perfect formula for a muscle car, and the sales numbers reflected that. These things sold really well. The downside was that the car was of generally low quality. If you owned one of these or just about any other 1968 Plymouth or Dodge, you could expect to be changing out either the starter motor, the alternator, or the water pump every six months. Let's back up for a moment and just talk about the Chrysler products in general. All of the true 1960s muscle cars from Dodge and Plymouth are on Chrysler's B-body chassis. These include the Roadrunner, GTX, Dodge Charger, a few others. This is a good chassis. It features a front torsion bar suspension that's very good. Not as good as what's on the GMA bodies, but better than what's on Ford's. The same is true of the B-body's rear leaf spring suspension. It's better than any Ford muscle car era suspension better than GM's leaf spring suspension, but not quite as good as the rear coil setup on the GM A-body muscle cars like an SS396 or Pontiac GTO. We really need to talk about the 383 engine a bit too. By far the vast majority of 68 Roadrunners use this engine, something like 97% of them. The 383 is a great engine. It lasts a long time, it's generally easy to work on, and when equipped with an automatic transmission, 323 rear end gears and a properly set up four barrel carb, this engine can deliver 17 miles per gallon on the highway in any B-body car. I like the 383, but it has some downsides. Despite what the numbers say, it's not really equal in power to the other muscle car engines. The Chevy 396 or most of the 400 cubic inch GM muscle cars have more power, at least typically. Worse, the 396 and the Chevelle, the Roadrunner's closest competitor in this market, could be hopped up more easily. Yes, you could build a 450 horsepower 383, but it was a lot easier to do that with Chevy's 396. For example, putting headers on an SS396 is easy. On a Roadrunner, it's a huge pain and seriously complicates starter motor changes, which you will have to do if you own and work on one of these cars. A 383 Roadrunner with an automatic and 323 gears is a low to mid 15 second car. Not bad, but not at the top of the list. It's fun to drive though, looks cool, has a lot of space inside and can get 17 miles per gallon. Helpful for the budget buyers the car was aimed at. Chrysler's engines, transmissions, rear ends, and brakes, and that means Dodges and Plymouth of course, are as good or better than the competitions, with only the big block Chevrolet V8 being able to legitimately challenge the Chrysler engines in power, and even then the Chrysler engines tend to come out on top in the 1960s. For example, the standard engine in many Dodge and Plymouth muscle cars in 68 was the 440. The competing big block in a Chevelle was the 396, which was awesome. 
but not quite a match for the bigger 440, let alone the 426 Hemi. Where the Chrysler products fall down is in everything that's not the engine, transmission, suspension, and brakes. In other words, window winders, ignition switches, horn relays, air conditioning, turn signals, switches, rust prevention, fit and finish. Even the paint faded faster on Chrysler products, and the liberal use of cheap plastic in the interiors just gave the whole car sort of a cheap feel compared to the General Motors cars. All that said, I still like them, I just can't make a logical argument for them. And of the Chrysler products that exuded cheapness, the Roadrunner is at the top of that list. It was a cheap car, and when you get in one, it really shows. That said, that 383 is a good engine. The Roadrunner did perform well, and it was a good package for the price. Plus, the car's legend is propped up by the 426 Hemi version, which was probably the quickest quarter-mile muscle car you could have bought in 1968, excluding tuner cars. It's really hard to argue for the Roadrunner against the SS396 in an objective fashion. Of course, muscle cars are not all about numbers and logic. If you like the Roadrunner, then you like it. And apparently, a lot of people like it because today, Roadrunners are some of the most expensive muscle cars to buy. I just find that ironic since this was absolutely a bottom-of-the-barrel budget muscle car. Plymouth's muscle car that was not bottom-of-the-barrel was the GTX. It's on the same chassis as the Roadrunner, but it's a much more upscale car. In fact, the GTX was downright luxurious by comparison. Available in a hardtop or convertible, this thing was, by Plymouth standards, a very nice car. Its base engine is the 440 four-barrel with 375 horsepower and 480 pound-feet of torque. I should say it was rated at 375 horsepower. Actual power was a little bit higher, 485 or 490. Now, the GTX could be thought of as a luxury roadrunner with a lot more performance at the base level. The 440 would push a typical GTX with an automatic and 323 gears into the low 14s in the quarter mile at about 100 miles per hour and with an incredible 140 mile per hour top speed. And that's being conservative. It could really edge very close to 150 miles per hour with good tires and the engine in a good state of tune, meaning good spark plugs and carburetor jetting. That big 440 just pushes the Plymouth ahead of the Ford and GM muscle cars in performance. There's no way to get around it. To get equal times from the Ford or GM products, you had to stack the deck with manual transmissions and drag strip type gearing and sometimes very unusual options that were difficult to get. Apples to apples, with automatics and gearing in the 3.0 to 3.5 range, the GTX wins. With the manual and 410 gears in the GTX, its dragster performance is really out of reach of the competitors from Ford and General Motors. The GTX also has pretty good brakes and suspension. It corners pretty well. The downside is the typical Chrysler product lack of quality in everything that's not engine, transmission, suspension, and brakes. The GTX just isn't a high quality car compared to the stuff from GM. Next up, the Pontiac GTO. In the GM hierarchy, this car was slightly upmarket from the Chevelle SS396, and it's an overall nicer car and with all the performance of the Chevrolet. Every new car in this video got a new body for 1968, and the new GTO looked great and featured quite a few refinements. Exterior, interior, whatever, they really got it right. The standard engine was Pontiac's 400 cubic inch V8 with 350 horsepower. It has a four barrel carb and a very high 10.75 to one compression ratio. That's very high for a standard engine. The 400 for 68 had changes to the cylinder heads, but was overall very similar to the previous year's engine. Considering both horsepower and torque, this was the most powerful standard engine in a 68 muscle car from General Motors. As standard equipment muscle car engines go, only the Dodge and Plymouth 440s had it beat. The Oldsmobile 442 was equal in horsepower, but with slightly less torque. Oddly, there was a much weaker 265 horsepower version of the Pontiac 400 that could be optioned in. It had 8.6 to 1 compression, a very mild camshaft, and a two-barrel carb. It's a horrible engine for a GTO. Thankfully, they were rarely optioned in there. I've tried to figure out why anyone would option this engine into a 68 GTO, 
I suppose the slightly lower price and running cost could have been a factor. Fuel costs would be lower because it wouldn't need high octane gasoline and maybe the flat camshaft would help fuel economy a little bit. But that just doesn't make sense because Pontiac has plenty of other cars to give a performance look with an even lower price and better fuel economy. For example, the Le Mans with the 350HO engine would be less expensive, more economical, and would outrun the two-barrel GTO. They also had the six-cylinder Tempest Sprint and a whole range of Firebirds. There was no shortage of lower-cost Pontiacs that still had a performance image in 1968, and some of them would have been faster than a two-barrel GTO. The only logical reason I can come up with for the low-power 400 in the GTO is for trailer towing. If someone had to have that GTO, they like the styling or whatever, and they wanted to tow their boat, the low compression 400 would be a good choice. The vast majority of buyers were happy with the 350 horsepower base engine, but there were two hotter versions of Pontiac's 400 available. These were the 400 HO and the 400 Ram Air. Each of the three high compression 400s had different camshafts and other minor changes. The HO and the Ram Air were rated at 360 horsepower. It's clear from every source available that the difference between the standard GTO engine and the Ram Air engine was quite a bit more than that claimed 10 horsepower. In fact, quarter mile times dropped by about a half a second with the Ram Air 400 over the standard 350 horsepower engine. It's important to understand that the Ram Air engine option did not simply put Ram Air on a standard GTO 400. The engine itself was significantly upgraded and a Ram Air system was included with that upgraded engine option. The Ram Air system itself was in practical terms more of a cold air system, but this made the hood scoops functional and added a meaningful amount of power and sounded cool. The Ram Air GTO had a mechanism to switch from cold air to hot air to prevent carburetor icing, so the Ram Air system was actually pretty involved. It wasn't just a case of opening up those scoops. The Ram Air engine was legit. It gave the GTO enough power when geared properly to run with the 440 powered Plymouths and Dodges. However, the Ram Air GTO had two big downsides. The first was cost. Adding that Ram Air 400 to a GTO added about $630 to the price tag, and that was a huge amount of money. Second, and more importantly, the Ram Air option meant you could not get air conditioning, an automatic transmission, or rear end gears that were good for anything other than drag strip action. The only rear end gears available from the factory with this engine were 4.33 to 1, which means taking a road trip in a 68 Ram Air GTO would be incredibly impractical. For me, an ideal 68 GTO would be with the 400 HO of 4 speed and 3.23 to 1 gears. That's a combination that won't lose many drag races, but is still great on road trips and can be ordered with most any other options. Overall, I really like the 68 GTO. I think it has the best interior of all the 1968 muscle cars. It has solid performance. It's a well-built, reliable car. Of course, there are some downsides. One is that the Pontiac 400 could not take a lot of RPM. It had a very low red line on the standard engine, and that low red line was not Pontiac being overly cautious. Of all the muscle car engines, Pontiac probably had the worst connecting rods, which prevented high RPM operations. That meant you couldn't put in a really hot cam and rev it up to 6,500 RPM as you could with an SS396. The GTO just didn't have the hop-up potential of the 396. The GTO already had 10.75 to 1 compression, so there wasn't much to be gained there. You couldn't go crazy with the cam either because hotter cams usually required operation at high RPM and the GTO rods just couldn't take it. This seriously limited the drag strip potential of a modified Pontiac GTO. However, stock versus stock, the Pontiac GTO comes out very well in quarter mile comparisons, and I'll put that type of data up at the end of this video. Next up, we have the Oldsmobile 442. As with the other GM muscle cars, it's riding on GM's excellent A-body chassis, easily the best of the 60s muscle car chassis. Better than Plymouth, far better than Ford. Of all the GM muscle cars, the 442 was the most changed for 1968. Obviously, it has all new sheet metal. The interior was updated and is pretty nice, but the big change was under the hood. 
As with the previous year, the 442 packed a 400 cubic inch Oldsmobile V8. It has 10.5 to 1 compression and 350 horsepower, the same amount as a standard Pontiac GTO, although the Oldsmobile has five fewer pound-feet of torque. Now, I know most of you guys know this, but the Oldsmobile 400 is not the same engine as the Pontiac 400, and we need to talk about this for some of the younger, or maybe, maybe some of the newer people to these cars. General Motors divisions built their own engines during the 1960s, but with overall guidelines from their corporate overlords at General Motors. Thus, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick all had 400 cubic inch V8s, but they're all different engines, not the same designs, and the parts do not interchange. Just to add to the confusion, a few years later, Chevrolet, Dodge, Ford, Mercury, and Plymouth would also add 400 cubic inch engines into their lineups. Back to Oldsmobile. This wasn't really the same engine as the Olds 400 from the previous year. And most Oldsmobile experts consider the 1968 400 to be a serious step backwards from what they were building in 67. The 68 engine has a different bore and stroke with a relatively small bore. It was under square, meaning the bore is smaller than the stroke, which was unusual for a muscle car engine. But this was done to streamline production by allowing the sharing of components with other Oldsmobile V8s. The 1968 Olds 400 also had lower strength internal components. In short, while it was a decent engine in stock form, it couldn't really be much more than that, which did serious damage to any chance of this car ever being the hot rodder's choice. But I don't think Oldsmobile cared. The 442 is intended to be a sort of gentleman's muscle car. It was upscale from the Pontiac GTO and a very good car. It was the best handling muscle car of 1968. It had great brakes. It was very comfortable, reliable, easy to work on. Just don't plan on beating the Chevrolets and Plymouths at the drag strip. Those guys would have upgrades the Olds just couldn't match. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you couldn't make your Olds competitive. If you threw enough money and enough time at it, of course you could. But if ultimate drag strip performance was your bag, the 442 was probably the wrong car. Now, I know at this point, some Oldsmobile enthusiasts are screaming at the screen, but the Hearst Olds, the Hearst Olds. Yes, I know. The Hearst Oldsmobile was really fast, but that was a tuner car, not a factory built muscle car. There were special tuner versions of every car we're talking about today. They are not the subject of this video, but the Oldsmobile uh, fans tend, tend to be very, very vocal about that Hearst Olds. Now, Oldsmobile used alphanumeric codes for their options, and W30 was the option code which added a ram added ram air and the ram air engine for a boost to 360 horsepower. It's much like the option on the ram air Pontiac. The air was rammed in in this case, not from the hood scoops though, but from underneath the front bumper. But like with the Pontiac, if that option was selected, it limited other things. For example, you couldn't get power front disc brakes, you couldn't get air conditioning or cruise control. As we saw with the GTO, these sort of restrictions were very common on top muscle car engines. And that's part of the reason the standard engines were much more popular. As with the GTO, there was a weak two barrel version of the Olds 400, which could be optioned into the 442. It was rated at a very optimistic 290 horsepower. In short, the 68 442 is a really nice car. I know I seem negative when I talk about the engine, but for anything other than track duty, it's a great engine and it's in a great muscle car. Next up, we have the Buick GS. It's on the same chassis as the other GM intermediates, which is good. Buick styling for 68 was a bit out there. The concave rear end is very unusual. I've never seen another rear end like this, at least not caved into this degree. It also looks to me like the rear bumper doesn't fit properly. It's like the spacing between the bumper and the body isn't quite uniform. I've never measured this, but they all look a little bit off to me. Every single one I've ever seen. This one is actually a 69 Skylark, but the back end is about the same. The interior of the car was nice, but it had a very boring dashboard as compared with most of the other 1968 muscle cars, and especially as compared with the GTO and 442. I've always felt that Buick didn't quite get the styling right for the 68 inside or out. However, even if you don't like the styling, the car makes up for it in other areas. 
Buick's 400 cubic inch V8 really doesn't have any glaring problems. It's dead reliable, it's easy to work on, and it's powerful. It's also one of the lightest engines in this discussion. Actually, I think it is the lightest. The standard GS400 engine was rated at 340 horsepower and 440 pound-feet of torque, slightly behind Pontiac's GTO. However, I promise, you put these two cars on a chassis dyno and you won't see a power disadvantage for the Buick. Horsepower ratings back then were nebulous at best. According to magazine tests of the day, the results of which are also nebulous at best, the Buick had the quickest quarter mile run of all the GM muscle cars for 68. And I'll talk about this later in the video, but as I've said many times on this channel, the individual options on the cars, the tires, the driver's skill, the environmental conditions at the time of the test have more to do with the comparative results of the drag race than the difference between these models. These things are all pretty close. Still, by any reasonable measurement, the Buick GS has performance equal or better than most of its competition, and in a very nice, comfy, reliable car. If I had to take a cross-country trip in a 1968 muscle car, no question, I would choose the Buick GS 400. If I had to leave town for a couple weeks and my wife had to drive one of these things every day, again, Buick GS 100%. It was that good. Buick also built a GS350 as well, less engine displacement, better fuel economy, but with all the other advantages of a GS400 in a lower price package. This sort of junior muscle car was gaining popularity in 1968, and all the GM divisions had some version of this concept, but I suppose that's a whole different video. Let's move on to Dodge. For 1968, Chrysler Corporation's Dodge division went into the muscle car segment in a big way. Plymouth was aimed at Chevrolet, and Dodge was aimed clearly at Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick. The Dodge products were very similar, or even identical in many respects, to those from Plymouth. However, the cars from Dodge were nicer. They were a little bit more upscale. I'm starting with the Super B. This car was late to the party, not showing up in dealers until early in 1968, when the others were showing up in late 67. The Super B is essentially Dodge's version of the Plymouth Roadrunner. Like the Roadrunner, it's packing the 335 horsepower 383 as standard equipment, and both cars have a four-speed manual as standard. The GM cars had three-speed manual transmissions as standard. It's important to remember that when comparing prices. The Super B was a pretty good deal. As with all the other Chrysler muscle cars, it could be ordered with the 426 Hemi at greater cost, but few chose that option. Compared with the Roadrunner, the Super B is a little nicer car. It has a one inch longer wheelbase, which translates into a little more interior room. The dashboard and the overall interior is nicer. The Dodge is 65 pounds heavier. It's more expensive. In practical terms, performance is identical to the Roadrunner, but the Super B is much more rare. While the Roadrunner was a huge hit, the Super B really wasn't. Dodge put out this interesting chart, which shows the Super B as compared with its competition. The quarter mile result here of 15.0 for a 383 Super B is reasonable, especially for a stick shift car. The 14.1 time for the Hemi is actually very conservative. However, the times for the GM cars are pretty pessimistic. Those times maybe are for magazines or legitimate tests, but they're certainly on the low end of the scale. Nine times out of 10, a typical 68 GTO is going to be the typical 68 383 Super B. The times shown here for the SS396 and GS400 are literally the slowest I've ever seen. Dodge did some cherry picking here. I don't know what's going on with that Torino GT time there either, but its performance is greatly exaggerated. No way would a 230 horse 302 Torino do that in stock form. Perhaps more interesting is the difference in size among these cars. Chrysler's unit body construction really comes through for them here, allowing them to build a car that's bigger than GM's A bodies, but at about the same or even lower weight. That's a big advantage that helps all the Plymouths and Dodges. They were simply bigger than the GM intermediates with more interior room and often more trunk space. This made them pretty good as family cars. Next up, we have the Coronet RT. This is the Dodge version of the Plymouth GTX. It's much like the Roadrunner Super V comparison. The Dodge gets an extra inch of wheelbase and is a slightly nicer car. I want to stress that the Coronet is not normally a muscle car. The RT designation denotes the performance package that makes this the muscle car version of the Coronet. 
The Coronet RT has the 440 engine standard, just like the Plymouth GTX. It also has the heavy duty suspension brakes and so on. Last, we have the Charger RT, and there's quite a bit to talk about here. The Charger and the muscle car version, the Charger RT, had all new styling for 68, and it was very successful. Sales of Chargers more than doubled compared with the previous year. The car was a hit entirely due to styling because under the sheet metal, it's just another Chrysler B body. Basically, it's a Coronet. It is in no objective way superior to the Coronet. In mechanical terms, think of the Plymouth GTX or the Coronet RT. The Charger RT is pretty much the same thing. A 440 engine is standard, the same excellent transmission, suspension, and brakes are there. However, the Charger is a bit bigger and heavier. In fact, the Charger was the biggest, heaviest of the B-body muscle cars in 68, and it was also the most expensive. I think Dodge was aiming the Charger RT not only at the GTO, but also at what I'll call the senior muscle cars like the Buick Riviera. These were cars that were bigger than normal muscle cars, but with more luxury, generally larger engines, and similar performance, all at a much higher price. Thus, the Charger RT fit into an interesting spot in the market where it could compete against a wide range of competitors. Its size really helps with that. For example, the Buick Riviera had a 119-inch wheelbase versus the Charger's 117 and only 112 for the GTO. One could argue that the Charger RT was closer in size to those senior muscle cars from General Motors than it was to their intermediate muscle cars. Whatever the reason, Chargers sold well in 1968. Now, most were 318 or 383 powered versions. And I should point out that a Charger with a high compression 383 four barrel was no slouch, but not quite a legit muscle car like the Charger RT. As with the Plymouth GTX and Coronet RT, the Chargers 440 put out an advertised 375 horsepower, 480 pound-feet of torque. Yes, it's a luxury barge, but with all that torque and the tire limitations of the day, it wasn't really any slower in practical terms during the stoplight Grand Prix encounters than its slightly lighter stablemates. As with all other B-body muscle cars, it could be had with the 426 Hemi, giving 425 horsepower. Fewer than 1% of Charger buyers selected this. Roughly 93,000 Chargers were built for the 68 model year, and fewer than 500 of them had the 426 Hemi. The RT package added $466 to the price of the Charger, but for that money, you got the 440 engine backed by the excellent Torque Flight 727 automatic transmission. The package also included heavier duty springs, heavier duty torsion bars up front, leaf springs in the back, of course, plus better shocks. All this gave the Charger RT pretty decent handling by standards of the day, the RT also got a better dashboard with more gauges, a better alternator, although that better alternator could also be found on some 383 cars. And the RT had numerous other upgrades. Now, in order to upgrade to the 426 Hemi, the buyer not only had to purchase the RT package for the $466, but then, then spend another $605 for the Hemi, which meant they couldn't have air conditioning. So the 440 really put a big dent in the sales of the 426 Hemi, all across the Chrysler muscle car lineup. The 440 was less money, easier to maintain with its single carburetor, and while on paper the Hemi had an extra 50 horsepower and an extra 10 foot-pounds of torque, it was hard to use that extra power with the terrible bias ply tires these cars were sold with. Some also made the argument that the 440 was just as fast. It wasn't, at least not in an apples-to-apples -apples comparison but they were close enough that a good driver in a 440 in a well-sorted but still stock car could win in some cases. In fact, as soon as the 440 showed up on the scene in B-bodies for the previous model year, 1967, sales of the 426 Hemi decreased significantly. The 440 was a very strong choice for muscle car power. The Charger was a big hit for Dodge in 68. Sales of the new model were about five times higher than for the 67 Charger. Again, this was all down to the styling. The two model years were pretty much the same in mechanical terms. Of about 93,000 Chargers built, about 20,000 were Charger RT models. Let's take a look at quarter mile times. As I've said, take these with a grain of salt because magazine testing back then was a 
bit less than scientific. I'll try and talk through these and explain them a bit. Starting us off, we have the Buick GS400 running a 14.4 second quarter mile. All of these times are rounded to the nearest tenth and miles per hour are rounded to the nearest mile per hour. Now there are a few things I want to point out about the Buick test here. First, it's from Car Life magazine, which for most of their existence did not accept ads from automotive manufacturers in an effort to avoid bias. The car tested was not equipped with Buick's dealer-installed Stage 1 or Stage 2 package, although those were tested in the same article, which causes some confusion. Now, this is a dead stock GS400 with an automatic, but those 391 gears give it a solid edge. The car used in this test was also a low-option model with no air conditioning, thus was about as light as a Buick GS could get. It's an honest test, just an optimized one. Note the relatively low trap speed for such a good time. That's indicative of a great launch. I should say that I have this test and all the others I'm using here in the Patreon section. It's at the captain's level. I should caution you that Patreon does appear to offer a free method of joining, but in my view, it's a scam. That's Patreon getting your information and you getting almost nothing in return. I have nothing to do with that. I have three levels, one dollar, three, and five. Let's move on to the next car. Sadly, for some reason, there were very few tests of the 1968 Chevelle SS396. We have one here from Motor Trend running a 16.0 second quarter mile. This car has a three-speed manual transmission, which was the base transmission, but not ideal for performance. But I still find that time to be on the slow side. The next time we have is for a 375 horse SS396. Now 14.8 is a pretty weak time for that car. The actual test was in Car Life magazine, and judging from the 0 to 60 times they had, which were poor, and the trap speed, which was high, it looks like they just couldn't launch the thing. We just don't have a lot of tests on the 68 SS396 Chevelle, so what I'm going to do is sub in a test from an El Camino from Car Life magazine. It's a 396, 350 horse, backed by the three-speed automatic transmission and 331 gears. It ran 14.8 at 95 miles per hour, which certainly seems about right for this car. Next up, the Charger RT, running 14.9 at 95 miles per hour with an automatic and 323 gears. Not amazing, but remember the 68 Charger is the chunky monkey of the Chrysler muscle car lineup. Then we have the Charger with the 426 Hemi, an automatic transmission, and 323 gears in the back. It ran a blistering 13.5 at 105 miles per hour. That's with an automatic and without drag strip type gearing. In this test, they also ran it up to 139 miles per hour and estimated that it would have topped out at 156. The road test on the 68 Hemi Charger is actually really fun to read. The car is just so fast. Interestingly, the author also mentioned the Vietnam War in the article. That's something that was rarely done in automotive magazines of the time, but things were really heating up in 68 and he probably just couldn't help himself. As stated earlier, this magazine and others are in the Patreon section in PDF form. Now next up, we have the Dodge Super B 383. It's running 15.1 at 92, which puts it about even with the Torino 390, although the Torino has a slightly faster trap speed. Of course, the Torino there is running a four-speed manual against the Super B's automatic, which helps out the Ford a little bit. The Cyclone with the 428 and 391 gears represents about the quickest possible Fairlane or Comet in 1968. That 428 was a rare option, and the 391 gears are heavily biased for drag racing at the expense of any kind of normal usage. In that configuration, it ran 14.4 at 99 miles per hour. That's a good time in trap speed. The Olds 442 ran 15.1 at 92 miles an hour. Looking at the chart, it's about average. However, the Olds driver is doing it in a level of comfort that doesn't exist in some of these other cars, and that's important to keep in mind. If you're going to take a long road trip, well, the Buick would still be my first choice, but the Olds would be my second choice. The 383 Roadrunner has a four-speed manual, thus it's running a bit faster than the Super B we looked at a moment ago. 14.7 at a blistering 98 miles per hour. 
Cars Magazine had a time of 14.65 at 100.5 miles per hour with a 4-speed and 355 gears, which represents about the best realistic street-driven 383 car. With automatic transmissions and 323 gears, these were more commonly 14.9 to 15.2 cars. The 426 Hemi Roadrunner puts in times identical to the Hemi Charger, despite the lower weight of the Plymouth. Next up, Plymouth GTX, and you may note that its 14.0 time, 0, at 96 miles per hour seems a bit slow. I see this time thrown around on the forums by the Hemi haters. What most people don't seem to realize, or at least they don't mention, is that this was a convertible Hemi GTX, which is heavier than the hardtop. It's simply the only time we have for a Hemi GTX in 1968. The test was actually a comparison of a Hemi GTX versus a 440 powered GTX. These are the actual cars from the test in this picture. The Hemi car, the convertible, is about one car length ahead at the 800 foot mark where this picture was taken. The GTX is a hardtop. Now the 440, the 440 powered GTX that is, which ran a 14.6 at 96 miles per hour. The whole purpose of this article was to answer the question, is the extra cost of the Hemi worth it? It's about a half second faster in the quarter mile, maybe a little more, and that's in a convertible. Judging from the sales numbers, for most people, the Hemi was not worth it. The article is interesting, though, as they switch out tires and gears a number of times and get some really impressive numbers for the cars. But stock versus stock, it was 14.0 for the Hemi versus 14.6 for the 440. Last but not least, we have the Pontiac GTO. The first time is for a Ram Air car with a four-speed manual and 390 gears. The Pontiac sales brochure only lists 433 gears for the car with this engine, so either these 390 gears were dealer installed, or more likely, this was a change they made after the car was introduced, as this test was in May of 1968. I'm sure some Pontiac expert will chime in in the comments and clear this up for me. In any case, 14.5 at 100 miles per hour, that's pretty good. This shows what I was saying earlier, that a Ram Air GTO can run with a typical 440 GTX or Charger and even be reasonably expected to beat it. But to do that, it needs a very expensive engine option and very steep gears. The standard Pontiac GTO was a high 14s car, although the only test we have of the car with an automatic is this one from a magazine with an inexplicably slow time. Later, Hot Rod Magazine ran one with a base 350 horse engine and a 4-speed, and again, 3.90 gears. They ran 14.7 at 97 miles per hour on their first run. That 97 mile per hour trap speed shows that it was probably capable of going quite a bit quicker. In fact, they did that, but with stickier tires. Plus, they removed the power steering pump, disconnected the alternator, did various other track side type drag racing tricks. They got the car down to about 14.3, although at that point it was clearly not in a street drivable condition. Now, there are a couple of big takeaways looking at these times. First, muscle cars in 1968 generally ran high 14s to low 15s on the tires of the period, with the faster muscle cars running low to mid 14s. The 426 Hemi cars were really in another league in terms of power, but at a much higher price. The other thing worth noting is that all of the normal, meaning standard engine muscle cars, are really all pretty close in terms of quarter mile performance. You probably wouldn't buy one over another based on a few tenths of a second if you like the slower car more for other reasons, more room in it or whatever. It's the whole package that matters. Otherwise, everybody would have been driving Hemi Roadrunners. Which of these muscle cars is the best? I'm going to say it's the Buick. It has very strong performance. It can be modded for even more with dealer-supported upgrades. It's comfortable and super reliable. Most of all, it just doesn't have any glaring problem. Of the inexpensive muscle cars, it's the Chevelle SS396 easily. It's just a better car than the Roadrunner or Fairlane in every measurable way. Now, knowing what I know, which one would I have bought new in 1968? For absolutely no good reason, I would have got the Charger RT. I just like it the most. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye and have a great day.